All right. Okay, everybody, we're gonna um, we're now going to uh, circle up for this breakout session. It's breakout number two, computational law, a cool vision of the future. How could computational law work? How are algorithmic rules? Um, how could we actually do this? So I'm very happy to say we're joined by uh, friends and uh, colleagues and our cherished sponsor at the Media Lab, General Electric, and uh, from the General Counsel's office, um, Chris, uh, what? Pereira. Chris Pereira. Um, Thank you, Doug. Please introduce yourself and, and rock the session. I will. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Chris Pereira. I work for GS Daza Set and the Chief Corporate Counsel and also the General Counsel for Business Innovation. So, work. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Jay over here. We work at a bunch of innovation projects. And uh, this session was really uh, done on short notice. Uh, I had dinner last night with Daza, Sandy Pentland, and we talked about, um, you know, what would the future for MIT look like if you wanted to set up an initiative around like technology and the law and how how could MIT be relevant in that space and so the vision is kind of uh, simple right how can we use technology to f inform a better legal system and I think if you go back of how other universities have distinguished themselves uh, you go to the University of Chicago for example which has uh, as you probably all know distinguish itself very much in the field of law and economics, going back to the 30s, really, with Ronald Coase and the Coase theorem, transaction costs, all of that. And it's really widely used uh, by the federal courts today, and it's kind of the prevailing th uh, way to apply law nowadays. So you could think maybe there is something behind technology where, you know, the next wave is not uh, law and economics, but it's law and technology. How do we make the laws better? by using technology to solve societal issues, right? And if you, another precedent I think would be, and this is just in the context of our solution, is that uh, there's something, as you all know, the uniform laws uh, that's put out by this uh, statewide commission, national conference of commission on uniform state law, where then they put out a model code and then each jurisdiction can decide whether they want to adopt this specific provision of a model code or the, the entire code wholesale. Now, our vision would be that MIT, you know, a department of the Media Lab could be, could be formed and uh, it could form uh, a platform that replicates a sovereign entity. And this platform, you know, would be operated uh, by students at MIT, would have a steering committee, and I'm gonna go to that on the next page, but the point of the platform is that it would be a way to basically model the impact of laws and regulations in a virtual environment, and thereby you you could play around with it rather than now where you really it's a one shot transaction. It's your best guess. You know, you 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 um, make a rule proposals getting changed 50 times, then it's rolled out. It was so tough to get it done that it's not being revised. You know, the effectiveness in some areas of the law is is assessed, reassessed, but really very rarely do you have a, a subsequent change to legislation. It just hangs around there and we all hope it works, right? So this platform actually would be more like a gaming platform where we would incentivize people to participate and you know, generates user data and that we could then evaluate for, uh, for law, uh, rulemaking. So this is a little bit more about the specifics about how this could potentially work. And again, this is a moonshot idea here and it may seem ridiculous to many of you. It's also a little ridiculous to me, but it's So we talk about it and it's hopefully more of a discussion. I'm just laying this out to you maybe in hopefully and then I'd love to get hear from all of you what you think about it, how you would structure it differently. But essentially what you have is you form a steering group, and it's a cross-disciplinary group of lawyers, economists, statisticians, ethicists, and you know, obviously those all the issues that come up and came up in many of the panels earlier today and yesterday. And they would, you know, small group, and they would um, advise really a group of students that would run this platform and we would also kind of form a Magna Carta. And this Magna Carta essentially would that forth, you know, what are the basic play rules? What's the kernel of the platform? Because it's not just a technology issue. In the end, you want to make society better. So they're tough questions, right? And some of them, again, came up today and yesterday. 
do we think sovereign identity is important and how we would do it? Will we do it through blockchain, for example? You know, would you have a rule utilitarian approach to how you roll out rules, how you test them? What is your like value framework? How do you define success in terms of economics or is it, is it happiness? How do you define all of that? So I think you gotta have some early view of how you would run this kind of experiment or this virtual community uh, that would be generated. Now, this, this platform would only be as valuable as the data you have in it, and it's hopefully you're gonna have as much data in it as possible so you can statistically model the impact of various uh, re regulations. So uh, there are two ways this platform would get data. The first one would be just users. Some of them are students, and hopefully, uh, as I'll explain later, there will be some incentives to participate, but they would participate like in SimCity through their, um, through their playing habits and that would generate real-time data. Another one is you would have sponsors or people that would want to roll out some new rules. Let's say it's a city, it's city of Atlanta just to pick on one city and they want to you know, change the, the speed limit and see whether it has a statistically significant impact on, on traffic uh, you know, fatalities. And so the city of Atlanta would load all of its uh, data in terms of traffic into the system and then you would kind of power the this platform with a data set that's actually real data set so it's a combination of virtual and real data sets in this case and that data hopefully you can anonymize it and aggregate it in a way that can complies with all the regs obviously it'll be a little tougher to do in europe uh, but that's kind of the the idea behind generating data for the platform and then ultimately and this is obvious I think wh why why the platform might be valuable is You know it kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning. This is really a way to model out uh, The impact of laws and regulations the way you really can't do it today It's very hard and you know if you if you do a new aircraft, it's like you work for G again, if you do a new aircraft engine, you would build a ton of models before you change the fan blades and see what's the airflow and all of that. And so we do it for stuff that matters like aircraft engines, but maybe the, the way we regulate society um, matters even more and we don't quite do it in the same way. So that would be a way to do it. And then also the rule, uh, or the legislative process today, as I mentioned before, is not dynamic. So in this case, it's kind of fast failure. You know, it's iterative. You would reevaluate it. You would have a statistical assessment, maybe on the back end after a year, how does it actually work out? Do we need to redo this whole thing? And so that's another way that you can fine tune regulation. And you de risk, obviously, new legislation because you can, can say, well, before they try it in the platform, there's some user data. I mean, it's a little bit like in biology, testing the mouse first before going to the human. And then also, you know, some of these uh, solutions that were discussed today and yesterday, you know, if you come to me uh, saying, look, we don't really need NDA, we can do the NDAs through the blockchain, trust me, I'm, I'm this awesome company from, call it, you know, whatever. Uh, California and trust me it really it's really gonna work right I'm gonna say do you have any data that it worked before right and so you know I'm gonna risk my position right if I roll out a huge tool across GE you know I tie up like a bunch of people's time and in the end it's not gonna work right that that's the potential downside so in this case maybe some of these solutions you can test in this virtual platform and then say, well, we have some user data. Again, it's a model, but you know, it worked in the in the platform. And so that that would be the the last measure. So I just wanted to go through an example, where let's say uh, New Tech City, it's in this case, let's call it Atlanta again, wants to uh, model the impact of of a tax regime, a new tax regime, to in, incent economic activity in low in low uh, income neighborhoods. And this is a uh, uh, an example Sandy came up with and you know can you change the sales tax in in um, areas that you want to where you want to boost economic activity and does it have an impact on on behavior of of your citizens so in this case you would partner with the city of Atlanta the city of Atlanta would put up an X price and you probably all are familiar with X prizes so they'd say they say okay I'm gonna sponsor this with a million dollars and you know you can decide how you distribute the money within the platform and how you incentivize to behave is that one winner or group or however you want to do it but you know there would be some real money coming in 
that for the city of Atlanta is probably insignificant, but for the platform, this type of platform for a model behavior is probably relatively enough to to real to generate um, significant user data. Then uh, you'd obviously have to anonymize the data, and but you would try to get demographic data, socioeconomic data. And um, I talked about the participation, and in the end, you kind of set a time frame, right? And, and in the end, you would uh, evaluate it. Um, and I think the way you would want to roll this out in the, in the beginning, you want to just pick projects that are probably get generate a lot of publicity and, and where you can, you know, if, if this really is a department of the MIT Media Lab, I mean, you want to, uh, you know, launch it with a splash and you want to be over the right targets, I think. So maybe tax reform is one, like corporate law doesn't work for a lot of corporate, I mean, that's what I do. You know, you see that in Silicon Valley where you have all these uh, private markets for securities. Is there a way to change corporate governance, be more long-term? That, that's another model you could run. So there are a bunch of ideas where you maybe want to focus on the areas where there's actually also some money to kind of get the platform started. And then if you wanted to roll this out, this is just a, you know, again, illustrative timeline. You put together this group, they have an immediate kickoff session, kind of planning it out. You would set up an administrative office within the media lab. Uh, you do kind of a feasibility study in a platform because, you know, easier said than on as always, it's obviously quite complex, the platform. Determine a budget. Um, you know, you, you put together this kind of philosophy kernel, how do we want to operate it? And I think that's why the cross-functional group is important. Uh, then, you know, develop the platform, your approach to city. You know, I always say, like, uh, you know, I was on the search committee for GE when we picked, you know, we were in Connecticut before and we, you know, did a, you know, whirlwind tour across the country to meet with a lot of mayors and, and governors and see, you know, who, who would be, or where would be our new home, right? And you can definitely tell there are certain cities that have a chip on their shoulder, right? That they're like smaller and they want to distinguish themselves. So this is a way that cities could distinguish themselves with tech, right? And honestly, Boston is one of them, right? They want to be a tech city. Maybe Cambridge is a great city, right? So I think we could probably get some takers. And then, you know, once you sign up a city, you would probably want to, you know, announce this new department of the Media Lab to, to kind of jump on that publicity. And then you want to use the credibility from your first pilot with the city, which you, I think, would offer for free in exchange for user data. Uh, get, some, get some data into the platform. And then the next client, maybe corporate client, maybe another city, you would charge for them. So that's the that's the moonshot idea. I'd love to hear all of your thoughts and tell me it's all dumb, but you know, that's what I've got. <laughs> um, come up here, please, um, and sit here. Um, so this e this in a sense with the same right there could be um, either of these two champion sessions who want who we're all fixing to do some groping in the dark towards something like this very bright and articul well articulated and achievable goal that you just put for us. So let's all rally around what Chris said, shall we? Okay, um, you're welcome. Now um, now let's beat the stuffing out of it. <laughs> it's Daz, I see the name and I'm like starting this off. So credit where credit is due. So let's oh, hand, round of applause. All right, thanks. I appreciate it. I do like it. Computational law, a fantastic name whose previous domain name owner must have let it slip, I guess. Computationallaw.org, yay. It's meant to be. Meant to be. Um, all right, so, let, but honestly, let's talk about it. So I'd like to just start with these folks and then bring everybody, can I make one request? You don't have to do it, but why don't you come up here and join us in this dialogue. Uh, if, you're in, if you're into it, um, come on up and we'll see how much progress we can make in the time that we have. All right, um, either of you all. React. Okay, so I'm buzzing. This is so awesome and exciting. I uh, I've been dreaming about this. It, it's I think that it's it, it's it's time has come. It exists to a certain extent when you think about the congressional budget office models and the OMB and certain private models. But I think the idea of being able to run models that maybe don't have just how much money is going to be spent as kind of the output and the the the, the unit of measurement is also very interesting. So I, I, I think it's so exciting. Thank you. Awesome. James. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, I can look like terrible sharpening idea. his Gosh, blade. I, I hate it. It's it's uh, it's horrible. Uh, but there's some redeeming merit to it. So we'll talk about that part. I, I think uh, immediately what I sort of gravitated to was simulations and um, things like that are are fairly well developed in the areas of like econometrics or, or or for economic analysis. People develop these. They run simulations. Um, sort of bridging the space between, I, I'm not an economist, um, but uh, I, I see them on television. But the, the idea that that kind of knowledge has sort of been reduced in digital form in different ways. So maybe they are working off of Stata models and things like that where there's been a lot of econometric analysis in the space, there's good data sets, there's some science behind how you structure these. And so as I've start, started to, you know, think about how to do this kind of stuff, maybe over the last 15 years or so, one thing I get hung up on is um, a conversation I had with a friend of mine who's a game developer. And if you don't know about game design, a lot of times what happens is you have the fundamental game engine that gets developed. That kind of programming is really different than from the next stage of people to come in and fill in the world, if you will. And it's actually very different in a lot of ways. They, they assume a platform and then they come in and they fill in this world with all of these actors. Most of those are physics-based sorts of constraints. So if you imagine people in a video game, they're shooting at each other, they blow stuff up. The action of those objects interacting with each other is also typically scripted and they conform to sort of API sort of rules that are in that environment. So just thinking through some of the other examples maybe that I see um, that you could see leveraging would be spectrum environments. Um, there's, there's some experiments going on right now with DARPA trying to see how you'd have a bunch of people doing radios and how they might interact um, simulating interference problems. That's more of a scientific computing problem and I think you benefit from having Maxwell's equations and things like that with easy to sort of pick up and program mathematical models. The challenge I think here is, do we take the view that legal reasoning is probabilistic or can be modeled effectively with multivariates? Do we take it uh, that it's maybe a mix with rule-based sort of systems and traditional case-based uh, AI? Um, is it an expert systems problem where we might have, you know, big corpus of information that we're drawing from? Um, so I think, for example, you, you brought up the speed problem. That's a video game problem when I, yeah. when I, when I went through the head. Or it's a cost-benefit thing and it's an economic analysis. Yeah. What is the impact on sort of trade or flow or something? So I wonder what the metric is that we're trying to evaluate yeah. when we're reducing computational law problems to simulation. Can, can I respond? Yes. So I think the, Thank you. the, the critical question, because if you think about, I mean, I study economics, so if you think about economics, it's the rational agent, that kind of made modeling, where it's got obviously discredited, especially in recent periods that not everything is uh, modeled based on you know, maximizing the profits. That's, I think, where you need to knock that harder. And that could, maybe it's not set in stone where you have the number of values off. Let's say maybe somebody wants just to do the rational agent. Maybe one is that is maximize happiness, right? Whatever your, but I think you have your right oh, you have to be You have to be very specific about what you're trying to model, right? Because otherwise, I think the, the models get too complex, right? And and so then you can think once the models are too complex, I think what AI can solve so much is trade-offs. Right, trade-offs between economics and happiness. Right, so as a next uh, stage, you could even. Th I mean, I think um, if you run a model like this, it's not going to conclusively answer whatever problem you have. But you ha have a better informed, uh, or you have a, a data set to better inform your opinion. So you could start with the rational agent. You can run it, you know, on happiness, and then I think there's the human element that you need to bring in that talks about the, the trade-off and what's the right trade-off, and that may be different for Atlanta than Hong Kong or New York, right? Doesn't I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I, I think you the, the I think the modeling is key. What are you trying to model, and and not to get exponential 
complexity by trying to do too much at, at, at one time. Well, and I think what's really cool about it is that it gets better because, I mean, the, 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 the first question is where do you start with a model, but then as potentially these policies become implemented, there's a chance of taking real data and seeing, you know, how the, how the yeah. model plays out in the real world and kind of like the weather maps start to calibrate uh, and, and see, you know, I, I, and it gets better over time. Uh, I'm, still to I'm, I'm still trying to understand the scope of what is sought to be accomplished. So uh, as I see it, and please correct me, the idea is to have a platform where you can model different laws or variations to laws. Yeah. And then see the outcome. And based on the outcome and the Magna Carta that you laid out, greatest good of the greatest number, uh, apply that model. Is that mm -hmm. the idea? Yeah, it's a little bit of a Buddhist answer I'm going to give you. It's not so much climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, it's more the journey up, right? So the platform is more the journey, right? And you're enabling kind of a something and people can use however they want to use it, but I'm, I'm not defining a societal outcome which is going to be very dependent on, on culture and who you are and whatever, right? I think the key value of it is creating a platform that enables analysis. That, that would, that's kind of the vision, I would say, and but is doing it, it in a way that's credible through MIT. But is, isn't that what uh, the... So may, may I offer, um, so um, hold that second question and then say it, but just to extrapolate that a little bit, this, I think the spirit of the conversation that gave rise to this masterpiece was um, a, um, which started from Tell me your name again, I'm sorry. Marcy Harris. Marcy, from um, Marcy's question, which was much broader. It wasn't really how do we model existing statutes. Um, it, the essence of it was how do we refactor um, what is, what a statute, how a statute exists such that it's now a creature of computation. And what does that mean for rulemaking? It would, would be quite different from the legislative sessions I used to have to be a staffer at and um, work on, um, on markup committees. It's one thing when you're writing like 16th century prose, you know, it's a whole different thing when you're arguing over parameters and vectors and thresholds algorithmically and, and identifying um, exactly by design, as Chris said, what are the expected outputs? What are our success metrics? Wow. So some of this isn't merely modeling existing laws, and which I, it took me a couple of years at the media lab trying to figure out what Sandy meant and coming up with ideas, which are all modeling existing laws, just the linear extrapolation. People saying like, no, no, Daza, not that, including Joey Ito at a big room, um, but rather transform what it is, look forward. So I think that's part of the spirit. And but when Chris says, let's find a jurisdiction, and like refat or like fat and um and create a, a new what method a new systemic t type is part of the spirit of it I think. That's is am I any, anywhere okay, all right um. Can I more. offer a meta on that too, yeah. just just quickly? I think that there's potentially the 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 possibility of this. I think in the future is is imagining that you could move the controversial political back and forth layer of policy making up to the question of goals and let the implementation take place more at the level of looking at data and outcomes. So here is the problem. I mean, from what I, um, law, as, as they say, that uh, don't ask how law and sausages are made. <laughs> uh, laws don't get made on purely econometric or economic or good, bad analysis. They get made as a result of compromises. So uh, at, a, at a micro level, I guess a platform can, once a law is made and you have three alternatives to choose from, I think that's where a platform might be effective. But what laws to make is a subject matter outside of the scope of the platform. Somebody has a perspective on that. Um. It's one of the guys I learned how to do computer stuff in law when I first was practicing. So thanks again. Marcy mentioned the Congressional Budget Office. And I'm thinking, could this actually be um, the CBO for the rest of us so that we could actually test laws and then enter that sausage factory and help people understand the consequences. I mean, it might be, uh, rather than be the, the end all, it could be uh, a tool that, you know, may help. I think it's a tool. Yeah. Okay. Any hands? Any 
more discussion. Okay. I'm going to go first. Oh, just a, a simple thought on the starting point, and, and, and this is just to see where we are in laws. We've often thought how, you know, all these states have different codes laying out allegedly the same thing, but you can't compare ever. And if we could put all the uh, different state statutes into one code system, see where they match, where the odd variations are. It doesn't really tell you where to go from there and, and fix the policymaking problem, but it'd be interesting to at least know what our baseline is. <laughs> and, and so it's something we've actually thought about uh, uh, as, a, as a way of uh, uh, just compiling this stuff and it might help know where to go from there. I don't know. In the past, I've called that mapping the policy genome, like trying to figure yeah. out how it all connects, especially across multiple jurisdictions. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Um, have you thought about uh, the starting, using the way people interact with their environments as the starting point? Um, in in the past, I've thought that maybe regulation would be a useful um, kind of entry point because it does deal with people's kind of direct relationship with physical objects. Um, you could just use Internet of Things to kind of to map out how people do interact with certain objects and then use that as the template to formulate uh, regulation that is reflective of people's um, is, well with with this with the rules that people abide by um, which I think might overcome some of the some of the real issues uh, that um, poorly created or whatever you want to call it regulation uh, is is that it's not usable or that people you know fall beyond the ambit of it um, so just kind of interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, maybe one thing I would say, I, I like the analogy of the Congressional Budget Office. Um, I think the bar is pretty low uh, in terms of legislation and because of, you know, I have, a, I have a friend, he's a world famous economist and he said, people always criticize me that economists can never project anything, right? And he said, but here's the thing, would you rather drive your car in complete darkness or with a dirty windshield. In economy, econo you know, economists, what they give you is like driving in a car with a dirty windshield. And this is kind of a dirty windshield. It's not perfect, I'm sure, right? But it's better than nothing, right? You model it, and nobody really models ex ante, you know, maybe a little bit exposed, but this would do both. Sorry. <laughs> um. Hi, uh, my name is Jeremy Fancher. I'm an attorney at Brian Cave. Um, you know, speaking of the dirty windshield being definitively better than you know absolute darkness, and I, I was thinking about you know in, instances in in law enforcement, for example, when uh, in uh, I think it was San Jose or some area, some city in the Bay Area started using Palantir data to identify uh, you know possible areas for where illegal immigrants lived and it created this feedback loop where uh, <clears throat> law enforcement started targeting particular neighborhoods and then those particular neighborhoods started reporting higher crime rates yeah. which meant that the model sent more police there which meant that more people were arrested there mm -hmm. and so I wonder if there are dangers in this model or at least in presuming that uh, there's no step there's no possible step backwards right where w there are I think pr a, a, there's a pretty serious propensity for dangerous feedback loops um, I'm just wondering if if that's something that that's been uh, that you've considered or how you deal with that I think one of the experts on this group should be somebody who knows something about feedback loops and data and what the hazards are of that right and it's a real issue I think you're right I mean, but it's not something that's an unknown and people haven't dealt with before and, you know, economists talk about it all the time, so, but it's a good point. I was going to interject to follow up on the, the, the policy genome problem. And I think if we're looking at um, the kind of people who... IPs, uh, those are attorneys. And I think, um, I think we've talked about this a lot, that 
we are all here because we believe there's a transformation in legal practice and at least there is a law of in the form of law of computer science that's evolved and and i think on the following also this idea that there there are, are pitfalls that we should be aware of um we will be the people who will document that genome we are the people who are prepared and trained and knowledgeable in that space and so as we're reducing these um, I think it's useful to think about these sorts of uh, how we represent knowledge well and reduce some um, these these sort of uh, domain knowledges to digital form because ultimately what we're trying to produce are essentially codes agents that are uh, knowledgeable about this domain I think we should probably focus on traditional kinds of law like a corporate law agent rather than maybe um, the reasonable person I think maybe subject matter and then reducing that yeah. is, is maybe an also fruitful place to start yeah. Well, and that's why I thought it was so exciting to see this model here uh, so well developed and thought out and to have the, the piece about the Magna Carta because I, I do think we have to start somewhere and it will be, you know, there will be so many parts of it that are flawed when it starts. But, but even to have people in the room that are thinking about happiness as a measure or mm. uh, justice issues and, and other things, I mean, and for ha that conversation to take place in a place like MIT as opposed to Congress right now. Uh, you know, I think, I think if, if you, these technologies are coming, if we wait for the political system to adopt them without thinking about them really well first, it will be reactive necessarily as it usually is. And with fast moving technologies, especially like AI where you're baking things into algorithms, uh, thinking about this proactively in a really holistic way from the get-go is going to be super important. You're going to do the report out if there's one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think happiness goes up to 11 on this scale. Just, just as... Thanks. It's Magna Carta. Are there other people that are talking about that as well? Uh, Mark Esposito of at Harvard is for one. Is this the same conversation? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there are other people that are talking about a Magna Carta concept with AI as well. Okay. Well, I've heard about the general concept, but not the specific Magna um, Carta. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, I'm just curious your thoughts on something. Um, so, and I say this speaking as someone who usually is the one building the gritty models uh, inside of these things, that um, there's a way in which, you know, you build them and you hand them off. And like we all, like we've talked about that they're wrong, um, like the darkness compared to the dirty windshield. But there's also a way in which like, once you build it, the person you hand it upstream to like, really believes it, even if you caveated it in all of the ways. And especially as like I hear about like, and I have no legal background, laws from like the 30s, and it's like, yeah, it's going to predict and be useful in when the internet shows up. Um, you know, is there a way just like our biases to believe these things once we start using them are going to cause us more harm than good maybe for the tools, you know, or what your thoughts are about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge one on kind of confirmation bias, selection bias, and all of these. And so I think this the, the idea behind this is iterative, right? So let's say we come out with something, but you know, we continuously reassess whether it actually makes sense and whether real data uh, confirms the model output or not. So there's backtesting built into it, right? With all the caveats of feedback loops and all of that. And so I, that's, I don't know, others, other perspective, that would be my answer. Well, I, I just think of it a lot like NOAA with the weather patterns. I mean, you, you have still, you know, 20 models of where the storm's gonna hit and eventually you know what path it took. Uh, I think over the next couple of decades, we're gonna have the ability to use real data in ways that we never have before. I mean, when you look at healthcare companies working with Apple Watch to actually have real data coming in about people's health indicators, so much information from which to uh, derive policy and, and measures of how things are impacting it, but the question is, how do we measure that? How do we maintain trust in order to have enough data in order to make these uh, models? Can I do a follow-up to that really quick? Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think NOAA and like the weather predictions are a great example because like those are trash more than like seven days or ten days out, and are just these long-term averages. And 
um, you know, it makes me really think about, like you're saying, well, we're going to do this iterative, we're going to do this feedback loop, but then also talk about how things change so rapidly. <laughs> and again, as someone who builds the Critty model, it's like, do we believe our historical data is reasonably even representative of the future? And no. are things, but then how do we do back testing or how do we do any kind of like, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I think curious. to me the question is, how long is your, so in, in statistical modeling, right, if you do like, or in finance, if you do option pricing, you say, okay, I'm gonna price my option based on a 30, 60, 90 day trailing period. In each period will have, you know, a different option price, right? So I think what you want to do, and this depends on the volume of the data, you you kind of want to, I'm a big fan of dynamic regulation. Or regulation, the way it happens now is through the rear view mirror. And I, I work a lot in financial services and I saw that you have this huge cost you load into the system because we had a financial breakdown, which ultimately maybe doesn't make all that much sense. It doesn't really go to the root cause, right? But this data set, I think, you, you create kind of a real-time data set that you continue to evaluate and as society changes, and you know, there are obviously political views on all of this, this so you need to have a Magna Carta. I think a shorter data set you know, is probably more relevant than one that's 20, 30 years old is, you know, in today's society. So I think you can you know, have a prediction about you know, how are we going to do this regulation, and after six months, a year, you do a test and, and you know, take another look at it. And with the expectation that laws are gonna change because now the expectation is once a law is in place, it's never gonna change no matter what really, right? And this is actually the biases, this rule will change based on subsequent behavior. And if it doesn't change, that's actually the exception because we think that's unusual in today's society. Mm -hmm. and, and Chris, uh, just to follow up on that, uh, I, I think the the bigger hurdle here in, in in the legislature, whether it's municipality or larger, is to create an environment for rulemaking where that's okay to to uh, to have not a full absorption of liability because we we had a rule that uh, that we had to change uh, because new data came in and now we'll change it again. I I mean certainly that uh, that's not supported now. Uh, the liability. Uh, is immediate, and you say, "Oh, this was your rule," and 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 everyone bears that, which which I think would be uh, a hurdle mm. to the actual implementation from model to actual rulemaking. Chris, if I could jump in here, I I uh, I, I love teaching comparative law. That's my favorite topic, and and Hart and Fuller had a very famous debate out of um, uh, essentially the Nazi war crime stuff and sort of got into positivistic perspectives versus natural law stuff. But the thing that's interesting, I think, on this is uh, uh, what is the function of law? And, and by studying these legal systems, we learn how it functions, what's the purpose, what are, what are the actual so social utilities that the laws are, uh, are, are getting at. And the other thing is we, we get a finer view of what we mean by law. How do we separate legal from the other stuff? Because I think the problem with the simulation pr approach is um, you miss very important variables when you create functions like this. And those can sometimes be the sorts of things that create the unintended consequences or create outcomes that are um, uh, not consistent with the sorts of data that you would observe empirically. So it's probably good to follow this weather sort of example. Seven to 10 days out, yeah, the model is not as good at predicting. But seven or 10 days after, the same models applied are really good at, at explaining why. So there's an explanatory power for law. And there's also something that's predictive really and provides certitude and all the other features. So Hart and Fuller debated about what are the things that constitute law as, as sort of the definition of law. And I think that's an, a place to start also. How much of what we're representing are economic systems or human behavior around uh, relationships with family versus communities. And those are the things I think, if you can find a place where the variables are easy to identify and, and quantify and the scope is, is easy to sort of trust, we might have less concerns. I don't know if there's some examples to start with, but the that's right. That criteria where the variables are what and the what what? So <laughs> you, if you're gonna create a simulation. Just those two things then. The variables are easy or small? Uh, they're they're well-defined, well and there's a strong relationship between uh, the presence or absence of those features and a particular predictable outcome. Oh, okay. Ultimately, law is valuable because 
And then that's what we grade. That's the metric that we use. How valuable is our simulation of law based on what we believe law functions as? How many features of law do we see in that system? Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Speak more. Uh, Who represents sorry, the city that wants to do it now? <laughs> um, I just had a, a follow on. I think this is a really fascinating thing to focus on uh, discrete variables um, that are you, that you can sort of identify and, and, and fix it on. But I think you know, the inverse of that is thinking about what what variables you absolutely have no you know the unknown unknowns right and right. and. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, if you just think about the different branches of government, there's a big difference between legislating and executing. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, for instance, I, I was I have a, a DJI drone and uh, I, I, I was like two miles away from an airport and I was like, fuck, I'm just going to fly this drone and it's fine. I, I, this happened outside the statute of limitations. It's fine. It was like six <laughs> years ago. Um, Don't make admissions against interest, please. <laughs> <laughs> and and to keep you out of jail. That's and so I, I, I turned I turned it on and uh, and and you know thought this is this is my little plastic thing with with spinning blades and so I'll definitely be able to tell this thing to take off. And it said no, you you can't take you can't take off. Um, you are within. You're, you're too close to this airport. I know where you are. Uh, the design specs of the device itself prevent you from. Uh, violating a law. So I think this is an interesting uh, distinction between a, a device that's essentially coded to not be able to deviate from a particular law, which is like, that's an amazing thing to simulate because you, what if you change the law, then everything just does that and behaves in that particular way versus, okay, we've changed the speed limit from 75 to 80. Of course, not everyone is going to be going 80 miles an hour. Until versus there's 75. autonomous vehicles. <laughs> Until there's autonomous vehicles. And so I think this idea of like, how does you know enforcement is a variable, right? And like, and I said police earlier, but there are many other instances where um, you know how much can someone get away get away with, right? Or, or if they're using cash, then they're not going to be reporting, you know, their their tips that they receive from the restaurant versus um, something that you receive in a paycheck and it's withheld. So I think like th this is a really interesting sort of the whole gray area of of human behavior and and what incentives there are or how much surveillance there is which dictates the the, the perspective that you have so on a law. The idea of a self-executory legal structure versus right. one that requires more direct enforcement. Exactly. It's a really important point. I think uh, one of the things that a lot of people talk about, especially in regulatory spaces, um, what what level of ubiquity is this? And how much how many people, sort of like one to many, are we talking about? Is the N really small or is the N really big? It, it absolutely is something I think people think about. Um, and you you certainly do that. I think, you know, you make these regulations or laws with an eye to the enforcement problems. And maybe if I can add, so I threw the cold theorem there for a reason because the cold theorem is from Ronald Coase. He won the Nobel Prize for it in a paper from 1937. And essentially it's about, um, you know, Coast. transaction costs and how private contracting, if transaction costs are really low, lead to a better outcome than through taxation and regulation. And, uh, the, and, and the idea behind that essentially is that you reduce monitoring costs, which is a real cost. So that goes to your example, right? If you have a technology solution that's embedded in the law, you can lower the monitoring cost. We should have an overall societal benefit because it's a negative externality. So again, so I would, probably be you can connect it actually to a lot of what's already there on transaction cost if you design this right we might also suggest that there's a, there's also a notion of nudges versus um uh enforcement sort of direct prohibitions and things so to take your drone example the drain scenario you're describing requires shape files on that device that are then updated or not? What happens when a new airport gets built and then you're flying your drone there versus, oh, this one is no longer operating and so now you're prohibited from doing it in the place that's the local park. So uh, those sorts of problems are, are one, one set of things. How immutable is the, is the legal structure? But then, you know, if you have a, a nudge and it's like, hey, you could really get in trouble. Like it, it talks to you and says, are you, I, I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave, you know, you or whatever, <laughs> you know. And that never uh, goes good. No, no, don't, don't get outside the drone. Just stay inside. <laughs> but that's the nudge maybe approach. And then you could see it giving you the right incentive and saying you really should not do this. And then you could ignore it um, because you're in a park. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Kosian point's really important. Oh, well, you know, the, oh. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry the, no, the nudge, I, I love the nudge idea. And, and you know, think of the cars and speed limits, right? The simplest self enforcing, the easiest one would be, so, all right, you, you never can go above 60, but then, except when there's an emergency and you want to get to the hospital, there are times we just, we're violating the law. We don't care. Do, do you just automatically get a ticket, or does it stop right. the car from doing it? <laughs> it's so going to be area, such a huge. Sorry, in jurisprudence, we talk about, of course, is the rule versus standards. So the the level of specificity that 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 pronouncement um, has is also that feature. So you could have a pronouncement that's really really loose, like just don't drive recklessly, um, or it could be a number. Um, and then there's the prohibition stuff. You know, you just can't drive your car over 55 or something, but you can always remove the governors. That was cool. More of that on um, car examples. Wait, wait, wait. Actually, I'm, I'm really want to say anything. Keep going. Well, so, so to that point about the car example, I mean, I, I, I was joking a tiny bit about autonomous vehicles, but I, I do think, you know, as we're thinking about these big questions, we do need to think in terms of the next decade, two decades, and then who knows what happens. But uh, there, there will be more automatic enforcement of, you know, a speed limit changes and all the cars get an update and people are not uh, going beyond the speed limit and drones are, you know, talking to the GPS. And so if there's a no-fly zone over DC because the Pope's there, you know, this weekend, then all the drones are notified. And, you know, I think the same is going to be true in, you know, lots of different places we can't even imagine right now. But it, it, it will never be perfect, I'm sure, but modeling will become easier because certain things will be um, more predictable. Well, I guess as long as I have the mic, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, it, it, the, the transparency of the model, though, is so important because I think of the one area where we really have tried to have models and policy making. You look, you look at climate change, it's the most complex model possible. And so you just get dueling models. And, and, and so, if, but, but I think you, you were saying if you can really transparently see the results uh, and understand what goes into it, otherwise, it, it, it gets, it's just getting a little too crazy. All right. Maybe to follow up just on that point, I mean, the, the idea of evidence-based rulemaking, though, and sort of evidence, you know, data-driven policy and all these great buzzwords are, are wonderful. But when we're talking about the subject matter of the regulation or the legislation or the enforcement action, if it's, you know, sort of adjudicatorial, you have to have an actor that understands that subject matter. And I think one of the critical points that I think many of us are sort of trying to make is that lawyers may no longer say, I can't do math. It's simply not acceptable, uh -oh. and it's not good practice or competent practice to pass on these issues without investing the time and understanding that whatever subject matter you're, you're dealing with. I think law and economics dealt with this actually very effectively over the last you know, 20 or 30 years. If you think about sort of the law of horse example, Easterbrook, I, if I think in that paper, he actually does make the point about the law of and then references law and economics. And, you know, how many people here would, would take on a client representation for a competition policy issue if they didn't understand, you know, basic micro? How many of these problems exist in the data space right now where we just are not prepared yet? So I think that's an interesting idea is that pedagogy is responding. There are law schools today that are teaching Python to lawyers. Mm. I think that's a terrible language, so that's yeah. a wrong thing to do, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, pearl, pearl. <laughs> um, hey. My fellow legal hacker, look, there's another legal hacker that's emerged from Toronto. Hey, Joanne, Hi. welcome. Hi. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, what's on your mind? I, I was just thinking, you know, about how law works now. Um, and, you know, we've had different points about enforcement, differential enforcement, and how feedback loops can be incorporated into the calculations so that we don't have um, more problematic effects than we anticipate. Um, and I, I wonder about that um, because I, I have yet to see that work extremely effectively um, in, our, in mechanisms for 
current law and current reality. And so I think a um, I think it might be false confidence to think that we have the capacity or or perhaps the inclination to um, to thoroughly integrate um, what would be necessary for us to adequately reflect the implications of law um, throughout society. And so I think if if we're going to pursue um, this uh, this approach or a similar approach, perhaps one requirement would be to have not only data but also kind of reflection um, mechanisms that are incentivized and also very usable by um, okay. by everyone and maybe with um, uh, some sort of scaled in some way to make sure that there isn't a disproportionate kind of emphasis on privileged communities or certain communities, you know, whatever, I mean, probably privileged, but could be any number of things. Um, and so that we avoid the kind of effect of black holes in our communities, which um, are, in, are mm, which in this process could perhaps be um, even more easily uh, ignored. I'm not, I'm not sure if it would be more easily ignored, but anyway, I mean, this provides an opportunity, I think, to uh, for tr transparency, and I think that there would just be useful to have some thoughts about what mechanisms would encourage that kind of transparency. Cool. Thank you, Joanna. Okay, um, and Chris, shall we uh, yeah, wrap? So, uh, thanks a lot for the you know high level of participation. I mean, enjoyed it very much. Um, if you if you want to continue the dialogue, and hopefully some of you are interested, I think Daz is going to put on the website a, a link to an email email group. I don't know exactly what you want to do, Daza. Oh, we, uh, I already did it. Just did it when we were talking. So um, I've, uh, I changed the um, the. You know, come to the conference and register um, at MITlegalforum.org to participate in future activities of the MIT Legal Forum. Thanks to Sandy, giving us a little more room to continue a dialogue, um, at least. And so, um, if you want to participate um, for this group, I think there's some people that have said they'd like to just have some email or some communications about it. We can set up one that's computational law if you just want to continue the dialogue. Who knows what, if anything, will happen with this great idea Chris had, if MIT wants to take it up or not, conversations to be had, worth having. But if nothing else, if you want to continue the dialogue in a forum, here you go, mitlegalforum.org, clicky, clicky, and you're in. Perfect. Thanks, Daza. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.